Okay, so um, first of all, um, thank you for inviting uh, for inviting me to give the talk. Um, uh, it's very impressive. I'm uh, uh, there have been so many lectures before me, so uh, I'm glad to to uh, finish up the year. Um, let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Aaron Mayer. I'm a professor of archaeology at Bar Ilan University. Uh, as you probably hear, I'm uh, a former, I came from the United States to Israel um, way back when, when I was a child, um, and I lived in Israel since then, um, studied in Jerusalem, went to the army, uh, and then became an archaeologist, and I've been an archaeologist uh, since the 1980s. And um, in 1997, or rather 1996, I started the, the project uh, of excavations at this astounding site uh, called uh, Telesafi, um, and uh, I'm going to give you a little taste of some of the very nice finds and, and, and the, the special remains that we have from this site uh, over the last 25 years, uh, and I'll be focusing particularly on the remains relating to the Philistines, the, the well-known um, enemies are Israel in the biblical period, uh, and of course the most famous Philistine from the site of Gat is, uh, is of course, the giant uh, Goliath. So let's start. Um, no, yes. So um, if you look at the map of modern Israel uh, and what we would call the southern coastal plain, that's the area between Tel Aviv and Gaza, uh, this is the area that in the biblical period would be called Philistia. And this is because this is where the, the Philistines and the Philistine culture um, uh, was situated. And in this area, there were five major cities, Ashdod, Ashkelon, and Gaza along the coast, Ekron, and Lachish, and, and excuse me, and Gat in the, in the uh, interior. Now, we know of these sites very well from the biblical text, and um, archaeologically, up until recently, uh, we knew about Ashdod and Ashkelon, which were excavated, and also the names of the site were, uh, the ancient names of the site were retained. Um, Ekron was identified with a site called uh, Tel Mik -e Mukhane, and it was then excavated. And then in 1997, uh, after I was just about finishing my doctorate, I was looking for a project to begin, and I decided with a bunch of friends to try to excavate a Tel Asafi, and many people had suggested uh, that that got to the Philistines was located at Tel Asafi, and we decided to give it a try. And when I started the project, I was, if you would have asked me, I would have said, oh yeah, I'll excavate here for a decade. I'll find great finds and I'll wrap it up and move on to the next site. And now um, after close to 25 years, and in fact, this coming summer, it's gonna be 25 years since I uh, started the project, um, I'm, still going away. And in fact, I probably will stop the excavation before I have all the answers. And the truth is, if I would work for 100 years, we probably wouldn't have all the answers. And um, the fifth Philistine city, Gaza, um, is unfortunately unexcavated, at least archaeologically. They're, they're excavating all kinds of tunnels there nowadays, but uh, that's not archaeology. And hopefully one day we'll be able to uh, get to Gaza and see what uh, what's, what remains of the Philistine city uh, uh, can be found. Now, um, Tel Asafi, uh, or Gat, is located exactly on the border between two very important geographic regions in Israel. Uh, on the one hand, you have the coastal plain, or as we said in the biblical period, this would be called Philistia. Then you have the area between the coastal plain and the central hills, which is in Hebrew called the Shvela, or this is what we'd call the foothills. And the foothills were the region between where the Philistines uh, sat in the west and the Israelites sat in the east. The Israelites and the Judites were in the central hills, the area that we would call today Judea and Samaria or the West Bank, and the Philistines were on the coast. And the region in between was sort of a, a border region, a region that when the Philistines were stronger, they pushed eastward. When the Israelites were stronger, they pushed westwards and back and forth. And for example, stories of the interface between the Philistines and the and the Israelites, such as the story of David and Goliath or the story of Samson, very often occur in this um, border region. 
And Gat is situated just on the border between Philistia and the Shvela. And in fact, if you go to the biblical text and count the amount of times that the city of Gat is mentioned in comparison to the other Philistine cities, it's mentioned more, more often. And why? Because it's the first place where the Israelites met, where the Judites came when they were going towards uh, Philistia. And that's why it's so important. Now, uh, if you want to uh, see it from a geographic point of view here, this is a Google Earth uh, satellite view looking from the east above the, uh, the Judean uh, foothills, the Shvela, looking towards the coast. You can see here Ashkelon and Gaza along the coast. And of course, this is the coast of northern Sinai uh, going towards Egypt. Here you can see the, the Shvela. And this already is the coastal plain. And this white line you see over here, this is what we call today uh, Route 6, the Trans-Israel Highway. And Tel Asafi is located just on the border, one foot in the, uh, one foot in the coastal plain, one foot in, in Gaza, and in, in the, in the Shvela. And because of that, it was an important point for interaction, interface between the Philistines and the Israelites. And a famous story, biblical story, and we'll, and we'll get back to this figure soon, the, the, the story of David and Goliath, according to the biblical text, occurred in the Elva Valley between Sochol, which is located here, and, and excuse me, Sochol, which is located here, and Azekah, which is located here. And this battle occurred somewhere around here. And then when the Philistines were defeated by the Israelites, they ran away in the, in the Elav Valley to Gat over here and to Ekron, which is slightly uh, to the north. So that gives you the basic geographic setting. Now, Gat itself, Tel Asafi, is in a very large site. And in fact, it's one of the largest, if not the second or third largest, pre-classical site in Israel. That means the before the time of the Romans. And uh, it's a site which is comprised of a large upper tail and an expanse of lower tail below it to the north. It reaches a size of about 50 hectares, which again is extraordinary for ancient times. And you can see here from all directions, it's very, very impressive. And one of the important features is this the white chalk cliffs that you can see on the north uh, western side of the hill. And this is an interesting and very predominant feature, which in fact uh, may have given the, the site its name in later periods. In earlier periods, it was called Ghat. In later periods, we know the Arabic name is Telesafi. Telesafi, Isafi in Arabic is something like uh, pure, so it's the pure mound because of the white cliffs. And in the Crusader period, in the 12th century CE, there was a fortress on the site which was called Blanche Garde. That means the white fortress, and probably because of these white uh, chalk cliffs. Now, We've been excavating for many, many years, and you can see here the upper city and the lower city, and all these um, marked off areas with the uh, with the English letters represent the various excavation areas that we have excavated throughout the, the city, and I'll talk about some of them. And uh, if you'll notice, on the upper city, we have one excavation aerial here, and most of them are on the side here. And the reason being is that this part of the tell is more or less completely covered over by the remains of the modern Arab village of Tel Asafi, which was abandoned during the, uh, the Israeli War of Independence in 1948. And since I'm interested in early periods, Bronze and Iron Age, this is an area which we haven't excavated extensively. But in the lower city, and we'll talk about this uh, further on, we have quite a few areas of excavation. And one of the reasons why we'll do this, and I'll talk about this um, uh, later, is because the Iron Age remains are right near surface. And um, if we move on, why aren't you moving on? Let me see. Hey, okay. Um, we move on. We get to the, the beginning of our story. Now, we're going to focus here on Gat of the Iron Age. The Iron Age is a period of approximately between 1200 and 586 BCE. That's the, the time frame. 
And uh, during this period, um, we have various peoples and cultures which are probably well known. On the one hand, we have the Sea Peoples and the Philistines among them, and we'll talk about, about them in a moment. But on the other hand, the Iron Age is the time when the Israelites appear in the land. And the Israelites, the first document mentioning the Israelites is just before 1200 BCE. And then the Israelites settle down in, in the land of Israel. And later on, around um, 1000 BC, that's the beginning of the of the of the Israelite monarchy, monarchy, the time of David and Solomon, and the two kingdoms finally to be destroyed in 586 BCE. Now, the Philistines are one of the groups that appear at this time, and let's give a little background. Um, in the period before the Iron Age, the period we call the Late Bronze Age, which is more or less between 1500 and 1200 BCE. The Mediterranean area was an area with kingdoms and empires and trade and diplomatic relations and a very, very clear world order. And we know this both from the archaeological remains and from quite a lot of um, ancient texts that have been found. And around 1200, a little before, a little after, all this world order starts, starts to come apart. And for various reasons, and it's probably due to a complex set of reasons, but this includes um, climate change, perhaps earthquakes, uh, perhaps movements of people coming from other parts which push other people, which push other people. And what eventually happened is the cultures and polities and kingdoms and empires and peoples that lived in the central and eastern Mediterranean went through an enormous change. And for example, in Greece, during the Bronze Age, we had the Mycenaean culture. Uh, and the Mycenaean culture was comprised of various cities with palaces, which ruled over kingdoms throughout the region of Greece. And around 1200, this, uh, these palace kingdoms started to come apart. And most probably the famous story of the battle uh, of the Greeks against the Trojans. The Battle of Troy occurred during this period, sometime around 1200, when things were beginning to come apart. In Turkey, we had the Hittite Empire, and sometime after 1200, the Hittite Empire simply collapses. In Egypt, the, um, the Egyptian Empire, which controlled both Egypt and into, uh, into Israel and even up into um, central Syria, slowly lost its power and withdrew from, from the region. In Canaan itself, the area of land of Israel, there were various city-states, and many of these city-states started to crumble. And at the same time, we see the appearance of all kinds of new groups that we were not in this region beforehand. I mentioned before the Israelites appear at this time, the Arameans appear at this time, the Sea Peoples and the Philistines appear, and there's a a whole new change in what's going on, what are the relations, what type of trade is conducted, uh, et cetera. And um, at this time, this is where the Philistines appear and perhaps the earliest and most significant evidence of the appearance of the Philistines and the Sea Peoples comes from these beautiful reliefs which exist in the temple, the mortuary temple of Ramses III in Egypt in a place called Medina Tabu, where we have, among other things, a depiction of a battle on sea, here you can see the sea battle, and on land between the Egyptian forces and these sea peoples. And among the sea peoples, we have a group called the Philistines. And this is our first mention of these people, who then, when we look archaeologically, we can see that just after 1200, in the area of the coastal plain, we have a new culture which appears with very different material uh, finds than in the previous period. And they settle along the coast in this area marked off in red uh, in, this, in what we call the southern coastal plain in Philistia. And they settle just opposite the green area, which I'm marking off here, the central hills. And this is the area where more or less at the same time, the Israelites are settling down. Now, this is very interesting because the biblical text, which describes the interaction between the Israelites and the Philistines, was, of course, written by the Israelites. So we get 
uh, a view in the biblical text of the Philistines through the Israelite lens. We don't have the opposite view of how the Philistines thought about the Israelites from uh, because we don't have a, we don't have a, a Philistine Bible. But what we can do is we can start saying, okay, so now we don't have a Philistine Bible, but what does the uh, archaeological remains, what do the archaeological remains tell us? And, and when we start looking at the archaeological remains, we see something very interesting, is that there's a very distinct difference between the Philistine culture, the Israelite culture, and the other groups um, that we have. And when I was in university a long time ago, um, the explanation was very simple. The Philistines are a group of people who came from um, Mycenaean Greece on ships, landed in the coast, sort of like in a D-Day-like operation, captured the Canaanite cities in the, in, this, in, the, uh, in the coastal plain, took them over and slowly transformed um, th this. And, oh, and they lived there. They brought their, their Mycenaean culture and slowly transformed over the ages. Nowadays, based on our excavations, we can see that the situation is a little more complex and that it's not people who came from one area, but from several areas. And it was uh, um, uh, a complex and lengthy uh, process, but nevertheless, most of the Philistines came from outside of the country. And this can be seen, for example, in the pottery. When we look at Philistine pottery, it's unique, it's different, it's very, very easy to identify, and it's very uh, different from for the pottery of the other cultures in the region, completely different from the Israelite pottery, completely different from the, um, from the uh, Canaanite pottery, and it reflects different traditions of not only the decoration, but what you do with the pottery, because pottery is vessels that you drink from, you eat from, you cook with, and it tells us a different story. And another aspect, which, um, which we can see quite clearly, is when we look at the Philistine diet. And we can see diet um, based on the animal bones. And when we look at Philistine sites, we see that the Philistines ate pig meat and dog meat. And when we look at uh, Israelite sites or Canaanite sites, we see that their diet was, well, there was much less pig and dog than at the Philistine sites. So, on the one hand, people said, okay, this means if you find a site that has pig, uh, pig bones, then it's Philistine, and if it doesn't, it's Judite, and that makes it very simple. And they said that's the, the beginning of the so-called tra Jewish traditions of, of kashrut, of keeping uh, uh, of the dietary laws of the, of the Jews, and it might be. But on the other hand, it's not as simple as that. And it turns out that even in some Israelite and Judite sites, there were people who ate pig. That means that, first of all, not even if there was a tradition of not eating pig, not everybody kept it and did it what was supposed to do. And it could also be that the traditions of not eating pig were something that took a while to develop. And for example, just recently in Jerusalem, at, in, a, in a house dated to the very end of the first temple period, right before the Babylonian destruction, a little piglet was found. So it means that not everybody in Jerusalem necessarily kept the, uh, the, the dietary laws as we understand them nowadays from a, a later Jewish perspective. And one of the very interesting things that we did with the, with the pig bones, and this is something that's become very dominant in archeology, span and I'm sure if you've heard any other lectures on archeology, span uh, one of the things that we deal with a lot is the integration of archeological science in archeology. span so one of the things that we did is we analyzed pig bones over a, a, a various periods, and it turned out that we could see that there's a, a clear indication in the, in the DNA of the pigs that they were actually brought from Europe, from Greece, to the Levant, to Philistia, during the beginning of the Iron Age. And this is a very interesting point. That means that it's not that the Philistines came here and then caught wild pigs uh, in, from the Levant, but actually brought squealing pigs with them on the ships from where they, they came from. And the same thing, by the way, we can see um, from the uh, plants. And we can identify plants in the archaeological remains based on usually charred, burnt uh, botanical remains. And one of the things that we see is that new types of plants are appear 
when the Philistines uh, culture appears. And this is, again, a, a, a reflection of food habits that are among the Philistines that are different from the food habits of the Israelites and the Canaanites. Now, but big deal food habits, but we all know that food is one of the most important identifiers of who we are, what we are, and you know we all know if we go go we go and eat food that our grandmother made it makes us feel good in your belly because it's something very very basic in your identity and this is an important aspect in which helps us as uh, archaeologists identify who we're dealing with okay so now let's start moving along the finds from the different periods uh in the excavations on the eastern side of the site uh in an area where we we call area a we found remains of a of a, a structure uh, you can see here marked off in blue and this structure was comprised of two column bases a rectangular structure in the middle a plastered platform and this based on the finds it was probably a temple now um, of course when we think of a temple with two columns in the middle we think of samson and knocking down the the temple in Gaza, not in Gaza, and in the biblical text. Needless to say, um, this doesn't necessarily prove that the, the Samson story actually occurred, but perhaps it hints to us that the person or people who wrote down the Samson story might have known what a Philistine temple looked like. And this is something which is we return to very often in, in archaeology of, uh, of the biblical periods. Biblical archaeology, what we call the, uh, the archaeology of these periods, is not meant to prove or disprove the Bible. We don't do that, or we shouldn't do that. Rather, biblical archaeology is meant, among other things, to give us the uh, understanding on the cultural background of the groups of people, cultures, societies in which the biblical text formed. And this is a very nice example, is that this doesn't say that we can have proven that the Samson story actually occurred or did occur. Rather, it tells us that perhaps the people writing the, the Samson story knew what a Philistine temple looked like. And by the way, right next to the temple, and here you can see the temple, uh, we found an area where there was evidence of metallurgy. That means metal production. And those of you who are familiar with the biblical text, uh, in the book of Samuel, it talks about how um, the Israelites um, didn't have metal weapons and metal tools, and if they wanted metal tools, they had to go down to the Philistines. And up until recently, we had the opposite uh, uh, evidence. In fact, up until recently, the evidence for metal production was from the Israelite areas and not from the Philistine areas. And here we found a metal production area right next to the temple uh, that I mentioned uh, uh, before. Now, another very interesting uh, topic is the Philistine burial. And very, very interestingly, for over 100 years of, of intense excavation in Philistia, almost no Philistine cemeteries have been found. And I always used to joke with my uh, students is that we know one thing for sure about the Philistines is that, is that they died. There's no question about that. What we didn't know is how they bury themselves. And this was a very big question up until really recent years. And in recent years at Tel Asafi, we found a cemetery, a Philistine cemetery. And I'll show you in a moment, we excavated one of these uh, tombs. And uh, another Philistine cemetery was found at Ashkelon on the coast. And another one uh, was uh, recently found at the site of Irani, about 10 kilometers to the south of Gaza. So we're starting to get an idea of how the Philistine uh, bury themselves. And here, this is a, um, a cave that uh, we found. Um, and it turns out there's a whole bunch of other caves, which hopefully sometime in the future, we'll excavate them. And um, we started excavating the cave. And unfortunately, it was partially robbed. And it had been robbed by a Bedouin who lives right next to this uh, the cemetery um, about 10 years before our excavation. And as we were excavating, the Bedouin came <clears throat> and told me how he had excavated here, um, you know, uh, you know, unofficially, and um, at some point the cave collapsed, so he had to escape. So thank God to the, the cave which collapsed, 
he he didn't he didn't st uh, steal all the objects from the from the tomb. But nevertheless, uh, we got a very nice selection of finds from the tomb, um, which included pottery and amulets and scarabs and skeletal material. And nowadays, using skeletal material, we can do some very interesting things. First of all, based on the physical anthropological study of the of the skeletons. Um, we could see that the people buried in the, in the tomb were relatively died at a young age, had a poor diet, and suffered from all kinds of congenital diseases, uh, you know, things like malaria, and they had bad teeth, they had arthritis, and, and uh, things of the sort. And this, by the way, is a very important point because very often nowadays we have that we're, we're pumped in the in the uh, in the public media in the popular media of this concept that well if we all go back and eat the food that we ate back when we were cavemen everything would be great and that's not true um, archaeologically when we look at um, populations from earlier periods first of all most of these people died uh, the average age was 30 or 40 that means it was a rare thing for you to reach 60 70 years old um, and that's why, by the way, a biblical blessing or an ancient blessing is that you should see your grandchildren. I mean, it's a blessing even today, but many, many people manage to see their grandchildren. In antiquity, it was a rare event. And the second thing is people had a hard life. They lost their teeth. They had arthritis. They, um, they had all kinds of other diseases. It was not an easy life. And this is something that we can see anthropologically. Now, DNA, we've done some DNA analyses and they should be published in the near future. And it comes out here that the people in this tomb were a very mixed group. And we also did isotopic studies of the bones. And there we could talk about aspects of where they came from and what type of diet they had. And all these things give us very interesting uh, data. And when we combine this with the data coming from other cemeteries at Ashkelon and Eroni, we start getting an idea of um, the genetic origins of the Philistines, and it's a very complex picture. Some of you may have noticed just last week, there was uh, newspaper articles all over, the, in, all over the world press of a very interesting study that was just published, which was studying the dental calculus. That's the crap between your teeth. That if you don't brush your teeth well enough, that yeah, is left. And based on this dental calculus, among other things from the tombs at Irani, just to the, the Philistine cemetery, just to the south of, it, of Tel Asafi, um, they found evidence of foods coming from all the way in East Asia. That means there's, there was banana um, and cinnamon and turmeric and things that nobody had any idea and soy that any idea that the, these things were imported into this region, into the region of Israel, ancient Israel at the time, and these were found based on the remains in the in the teeth. Now, Goliath, as I said, he's one of the most famous people who lived at the site. And the David and Goliath story is a fascinating story. I recommend everybody going back and reading the story if you don't remember it. Um, now, first of all, it's a complex story, and, and uh, biblical scholars think that it's a multi-layered story, and that perhaps David was added in at some stage, and Goliath was added in at some stage, and it, and there are various versions. And for example, in some of the versions, David, is, the Goliath is more or less the size of, he's taller than Wilt, Wilt Chamberlain. In other places, he's he's uh, he's less tall. The name Goliath is interesting. It's a non-Semitic name, and when you look at the military equipment that he is uh, carrying in the biblical text. It's a, it's a very interesting melange of various equipment. All kinds of things are very interesting about the story. And of course, he comes from God. And when we excavated the site, of course, people immediately say, well, if you're excavating the site of God, you're going to find skeletons that are enormous, right? And because Goliath was more than... Uh, something like eight feet tall. So we're going to find his brothers or him himself, and we're going to find enormous uh, uh, bones. So first of all, we haven't found enormous bones. And in fact, all the bones of people from God, Philistines from God are completely normal size for this period. And in fact, I would guess that the reason why Goliath and other people from God and other Philistines are described as giants, it's because 
the biblical text wants to uh, exaggerate the size of the enemies of Israel. Just like, you know, when you when you go fishing and you, come, and you catch a fish this size, you tell your friends that you catch a fish this size. So I think that's something uh, in this aspect. And another very interesting, fascinating find is that we found a small inscription at the site, um, which on it, it has apparently two names written in a very archaic alphabetic text. And these names, they're not Goliath, but they're two names that are very similar to the name Goliath. They're, they come from the same family of names as, as the name Goliath. So what this means is that while we haven't found evidence of Goliath, either in his bones or a, an inscription of Goliath, we do have evidence that at Gath, at Philistine Gath, more or less at the time uh, of David and Goliath, that means the 10th century, there were people with similar names. And it's we haven't found Goliath's serial bone, but not far from it. Next. Now, perhaps the, the most dramatic archaeological evidence that we have at the site is the site's complete destruction around 830 BCE at the hands of Hazael, the king of Aram Damascus. And this is a, an event which is described very briefly in uh, 2 Kings 12, 18 in the Hebrew version or 17 in some of the other versions. And what we find is that Wherever we excavate on the site, we find the remains of an enormous destruction. All the houses burnt down, things collapsed, objects where they were found, sometimes the skeletons of people um, found in the destruction. And this is on the upper city and the lower city, wherever we go. And here, and this is what, what we call stratum uh, A3, and we can find complete assemblages of hundreds upon hundreds of vessels. It's almost like a Pompeian moment. Something that, you know, this astounding destruction, which gives us this window into exactly what was happening at the site at the time, where people stored their food, where they ate, where they uh, did everything. And some of the vessels that we find are so well preserved that they look as if they came out of the potter's workshop uh, the day before the destruction. And they're, they look as if they're ready to go into, straight into the museum. And this is an astounding opportunity. And every year we excavate um, in this destruction level. And I must say, there is nothing more fun than pulling out a, a complete vessel from 3,000 years ago. Uh, people remember this. Uh, um, and it's, it's really quite an experience. Some of the finds are very interesting. For example, here we have cooking vessels and cultic vessels. And this is a vessel which we call um, uh, uh, a beer jug. And from this vessel and another similar one, we managed to uh, isolate the ancient yeast here, this vessel and this vessel, the ancient yeast cells that were originally in this vessel. It's not the same yeast cells, but it's their great, 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 great grandchildren who continue to exist um, throughout the ages. And we were able to identify these yeast cells, to grow them, to um, make a, uh, you know, to check what their species was. And it turned out these were the species that you make beer with. And subsequently, we actually made beer. And the beer was very, very tasty. And here you can see, um, this is uh, the team, a bunch of archeologists and a bunch of micro, um, 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 microbiologists who we teamed together to make this. And here we're tasting. Uh, the first uh, sample of the beer as it was taken out from the bottles that we uh, made. And um, uh, what, just before we tasted, I told everybody is that either it's going to be tasty or in five minutes, we're all going to be dead. And we lived to tell the story. And it was so good that we're even thinking of making this into a, uh, selling it to a, a beer company and making a special beer, and uh, the suggestion is to call it Goliath beer. Now, just like we had remains of the destruction in the in the upper city, the same thing goes for the lower city, and the lower city is even more unique because the upper city, after the destruction by Hazael, in most of the areas 
after a century, after two centuries, after a thousand years, people came back and built up. So when we excavate in the upper city, we very often have to go through many, many layers of later finds until we get to the Chazael destruction. On the other hand, in the lower city, the situation is different. There, the Philistine city existed, but after the Chazael destruction, nobody ever came and settled there. So that means that when I come to the lower city nowadays, I can sometimes see on surface before excavation, the architecture, the remains of the architecture of the Iron Age city. And if I start excavating, right below surface, I start finding the, those enormously rich finds from the destruction. And we started excavating in various areas. And I'll talk about first in this area, and then afterwards we'll go to the eastern area. And in the western area, we found a temple, again, with the fascinating finds uh, of the destruction of Hazael with the complete vessels. You can see oodles and oodles. And very, very importantly, in the center of this temple, a unique stone altar. And this stone altar is very special because on the one hand, it's similar to the altars that we know from the biblical text with the four uh, cornered, uh, the four, four horns. And similar altars have been found at other Israelite sites and, and sites in the Iron Age. But on the other hand, it's different. So it's on the one hand, it's a there there are some connections with with Israelite cultic traditions. On the other hand, it's different. And this is a very nice example of how the Philistine cultures, on the one hand, it combines foreign elements and local elements together, even in the same uh, object. Now, when we start here, we had area D, and right next to the temple, which is lo located over here. We found, oh, oh sorry, oh, um, before I get to that, again, we'll stop for a second. As I explained, the lower city is an area where right below surface, we have the ancient remains. Now, we excavate what we can, but you can't excavate everything. Modern archaeology demands careful, slow excavation. And even if I worked for 100 years at this site, I wouldn't be, be able to excavate the entire thing. So what we do is we use methods called remote sensing, which basically help us see below the surface and give us an idea of what the finds are below the surface. And based on the remote sensing, and this is type of remote sensing called magnetometry, that basically is we shoot out uh, electromagnetic waves and the way they bounce back we can tell what's going to be under the surface. And based on this, we can find areas where to excavate. And you'll see some areas in a moment where we excavated based on the remote sensing. And where we don't excavate, we can connect the dots between the excavated areas based on the remote sensing. So it's sort of like a way of adding additional information, even though we haven't excavated. And Next to the temple, we found this big uh, uh, gate of the city, and this is one of the gates of God, and um, the gates of God are important because we have a great story in the biblical text in which David, when running away from King Saul, Saul didn't like him, he was chasing him, he runs away to the city of God, to the king of God, Achish, Achish. And Achish and his servants meet God, meet David at the at the gate, and David wants to come in. And Achish's servants say, "What are you letting this guy in? This is the guy who killed our our friend Goliath." And David realizes uh, he's a, he's in danger. He fakes that he's mad, and this occurred at the at the gate of God. So of course, finding a gate of God is very very uh, interesting. It's not necessarily this gate, but it's one of the gates of God. And here you can see the various plants. But when we took the remote sensing of the entire lower area, this is remote sensing. And you can see from the remote sensing all kinds of features that appear all over. And for example, look over here. There's these straight lines and uh, what seem to be rooms, and there's a building here situated over here. And based on these remains, we decided let's excavate here, 
and let's excavate here. And we opened up an area here and an area here, and we found astounding remains. Here we found remains from the destruction of the Hazael, um, the destruction of the city, and below it, early remains. Um, here we found a very large building from the time of the Iron Age. You can see a, another view of it. And slightly to the south, exactly based on the remains that we saw in the remote sensing, we opened up an excavation area. We found several houses and an alleyway and the plan, and these fit in exactly as it was marked off here. Here you can see the alleyway, here you can see the houses. So it gave us a very clear indication of what we were going to find. And uh, in fact, it turned out that in each house, there was an olive press. And this olive press was for producing olive oil, which was one of the most important staples of, uh, of the agricultural economy in the uh, ancient Near East. And here you can see some of the fantastic finds coming out on surface. You can see this is this is the surface, and right below the surface, this is what you're finding, complete vessels, um, loom weights, and um, you know all kinds of different complete vessels as they're coming out. And if you look at the smiles that these people have as they pull out a complete vessel, it really is an experience. And, and over the 20, 25 years of excavation, hundreds, if not several thousands of people have come to excavate at Tel Asafi, and I must say that every time a volunteer team member pulls out a, a complete vessel, it's something that he has a smile, he or she has a smile that they'll never forget. And it's something that they will tell about to their friends, children, grandchildren for, for, for as long as they live. And here you can see these are finds that are 3,000 years old, and you're finding them as if they um, came out of the potter's workshop the day before yesterday. And this is the dramatic remains of the Hazael destruction. And this is, in fact, the end of the Philistine city. And when the Hazael destruction is over, we basically uh, say goodbye to the Philistines at Tel Asafi. Now, before we end the story of the Philistines at Tel Asafi, we have to deal with a very interesting thing. When I started the project in 1996, one of the first things I do is I looked for uh, early um, aerial photographs and I found aerial photographs taken in the 1970s. And I found an aerial photograph taken in the 1945, just at the end of World War II by the British Air Force. And here you can see an aerial photograph of, this, of the tell here, the upper tell with the village of Tel Asafi on it. This is the lower tell and you can see there's no construction here. And, but the most interesting thing I saw was this feature surrounding the site from the eastern, southern, and western side. And here marked off on the plan, you can see this, uh, this feature here. And what this turns out to be is an enormous siege system that surrounds the site, which was built by Hazael. And this siege system comprised of a deep trench, about two kilometers long, dug down into the bedrock. And along the trench, there was probably uh, a wall and several towers. We found two of them. There's prob pr probably more. And this was built to enclose the city. And uh, we mentioned before that in one of the future lectures you're going to hear, you're going to get a tour of Masada. Masada is, of course, famous for the last stand of the Zealots in the end of the Second Temple period. But of course, there's the Roman siege around it. And this siege is 900 years earlier, an Aramean siege. And in fact, it's probably the earliest known siege that we have in the world from an archeological perspective. And the Arameans built this siege, this siege system around the site to prevent the uh, besieged people of God from escaping, to prevent them from attacking the besiegers and for, to prevent them from receiving supplies and, and reinforcements. And we don't know how long this siege took, but it probably took several months. But in the end, it was effective because when we go on site, 
we find the entire site was destroyed. And so the destruction of Gat, as we see in the areas from the destroyed houses and all the remains, are reinforced by the remains of this astounding um, uh, research, what do you call it, the siege system that we find afterwards. Now, Philistine God is over. And in fact, in 830, that's the end of the Philistine city of God. And, and for example, in later biblical and Assyrian sources, the when they mention Philistine cities, there's no mention of God because that doesn't exist anymore. But we did find some interesting remains from the end of the Iron Age on the site. And one of them is a very interesting story. And if you look, open the book of Amos, chapter one, verse one, when, he, when, when Amos tells us when he prophesied, he, he tells us that he started prophesying two years after the earthquake in the, in the days of Uziel, the king of, of Judah. And here at Gath and at a few other sites, they have found evidence of a mid eighth century uh, earthquake. And you can see it very quick, very nicely here. Here you have the ninth century destruction level. That's the Chazael destruction level. Right above it, we find a big pile of fallen mud bricks. And between the destruction level and the mud bricks, we have what we call Aeolian sediment, which is a fancy way of saying, of saying uh, wind blown dust, which accumulated over years. So that means that before the bricks fell, they were quite a few years of dust being collected on top of the ninth century destruction level, and then it fell. And then on top of the bricks, we have two late eighth century uh, levels. So that means somewhere between 830 and sometime in the late seven, uh, uh, eighth century, let's say 701, 712, something like that, um, these bricks fall, fell. Now, if we try to figure historically when the earthquake of Uziel was, most scholars would place it around 760. This fits in perfectly. And so what we apparently have here is evidence of the earthquake and how did the earthquake work? Earthquakes have two waves of energy. Usually you first have a, the first wave is a horizontal wave, which pushes walls off their foundation. And then a few seconds later, uh, the second wave, which is called the S wave, and it has a wavy uh, shape, hits the walls, and that usually causes the bricks, uh, a wall to collapse over. And so we have here very nicely, the wall was pushed and then collapsed. And here we have excellent evidence of this mid eighth century destruction. And this fits in beautifully with the evidence of from the book of Amos, two years before the earthquake. And several centuries later, in the book of Zechariah, they still remember the mid eighth century earthquake, which hit Jerusalem in the time of Uzziah, the king of Judah. And the same thing, there are hints in the book of uh, Isaiah. So we have here a very nice um, uh, interface between the biblical texts and various memories of a mid eighth century earthquake. And nowadays the geologists say that there may have been more than one earthquake in the eighth century. And on the other hand, the archeological remains from Gat and from other sites, which tell us uh, this story. So I'm gonna uh, stop here and um, I'm gonna say thank you. And uh, here you can see us excavations. And if oil goes well, as opposed to the summer of 2020, in the summer of 2021, we plan to be in the field. And from the 4th of July to the 30th of July, we'll be excavating. And I invite you all to join us. And uh, one of the uh, members of the, of the crowd, Jim, has already expressed interest in joining. I hope others will. And if you want to, go to our website, gotwordpress.com. And there you can find information about the project, information about volunteering, uh, online registration, and hopefully, hopefully, with the vaccinations in Israel and the vaccinations throughout the world, sometime in the late uh, spring, maybe early summer, 
um, things will go back to normal and you can join us. And in the meantime, if you want to read a little more about the project, you can go to the website or those of you who have access, access online, go to the Near Eastern Archaeology uh, issues. There are two issues that are completely de uh, devoted to the excavations at the site, and you can read all kinds of interesting things there. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed yourself, and I hope I'll see you in the summer.